Good morning, friends. Welcome to Sycamore. We hope you feel so very much at home in this very special place and space. And please let us make you feel that way. And if you're here with us for the very first time, we so want you to feel a part of the life and work of this church family. Uh, For those who don't have a church home in the greater Cincinnati area, we want to sincerely invite you to consider uniting with this family of faith. Our next new members class is going to be this coming Saturday, the 21st from 8.30 in the morning until 12.30, uh, ending with lunch. We'd love to have you be a part of that. And if you'd like to register, just contact the church office. And please use the friendship pads to note your presence this morning. That means pick them up and pass them. Uh, If you'll do that and be attuned to the neat folk who are seated nearby, uh, that would be a blessing to you and that would be a blessing to others. Thank you for that. Uh, We have a couple of things just to highlight for you. Included in that, uh, we're delighted to learn of the safe return of our missioners uh, who were serving in your name just recently on the Blackfoot Reservation in uh, Browning, Montana, helping to work on building a Christian camp there. Our missioners returned at about 11 o'clock last night to CVG, and we hope they're getting a little sack time. We're grateful for their energy and effort and the leadership of the team that went with them. I want to remind you, too, that uh, people are continuing to sign up for the upcoming Riverbend concert on Saturday the 4th. You could do that today. And our senior adult ministry called Prime Timers is taking a fall trip in September to Lancaster, PA. There's information about it. Uh, the final payment for that is due this month. Great time to be out in that wonderful region of this country. Some of you just share with me on a daily basis. You drive up and down Montgomery Road and you are interested in and blessed by what you see happening uh, on the work site as our new sanctuary uh, continues uh, to be moved forward with all kinds of progress being made. Uh, but we thought we, you would appreciate giving, being given the latest update in terms of things that are happening in that project now, since uh, many of you have had a chance as a part of our Take a Peek Sunday to go out there and actually see it and experience it. And so this morning, on behalf of our facility development team, Ron Green is giving us a brief update. He's done that all three worship services, just as Susan John Stahl has been special music, all three worship services along with Joe Dilley, and we're just grateful. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, as Larry said, it is uh, the project is moving along quite well. Um, you probably noticed out in Harper Hall, we have uh, the new family restrooms framed in, the doorways cut through the wall, and a uh, mechanical room that's, that's put in there. Um, Also, in the sanctuary, since the walkthrough, uh, some changes, the windows have gone in, uh, some of the drywall has been completed in the uh, restrooms and the narthex and media center, and a lot of the mechanics, the electric, plumbing, and and HVAC is about wrapped up, so you'll start to see uh, drywall going in the the sanctuary. Also, the interior stone has been completed in the sanctuary. I think you'll, you'll like that. Uh, below us, the, the new youth space, uh, that's been uh, all cleared out and been demolished and been reframed to, to what it's going to be. Uh, a lot of the, the plumbing and the electric is complete. And tomorrow, starting tomorrow, they're going to redo uh, some of the HVAC duct system uh, to help improve it in the basement and then also up here, uh, which this will become our new Harper Hall. Um, out on the site, uh, the parking that goes along uh, our construction site, they have to add some islands, so you'll start to see uh, construction there, and some of the parking area will be uh, closed off. So uh, if you plan on parking out there, be aware that there may be some, uh, some closures out there. Thank you. Join with me in our call to worship. I was glad when they said unto me, Let us go into the house of the Lord. 
For here we find newness and wholeness of life. Here we sense the renewing presence of Christ. Here we can now stand our past and envision our future with the eyes of God. Let us rejoice in the goodness of our God. Let us sing praises to the Lord. We come to worship the living God this day, and as we sing praises, and as we come into God's presence, we recognize that we have failed and we have sinned. We have fallen short of what God intends for our lives. So we come together to corporately confess our sins. Let us now confess our sins in our prayer together. O Lord, our God. We long to worship you in sincerity and truth. We confess that at times we simply go through the motions of worship and that it becomes a meaningless ritual. Our faith is formal, our responses are stilted, and our praise is perfunctory. Help us to acknowledge that we are truly before you. Help us to share the truth about our deepest feelings and help us to receive joyously the forgiveness and power now being offered up in dynamic praise to you and in loving service to others. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ has set us free from the law of sin and death. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ we are forgiven. Amen.
Please be seated. Our scripture lesson comes from the book of James, James chapter 1. It may be found in the Pew Bible on page 1881 if you would like to follow along as the word is read out loud. James chapter 1, and we start reading at verse 22. Listen to God's word. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like a man who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But the man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do this Not forgetting what he has heard, but doing it, he will be blessed in what he does. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And I have the privilege of inviting the children to come down for the children's message this morning. So if the children will come down. Good morning, friends. How are you this morning? Are you good? Have you had a good, have you had a good summer? Having a good time? Well, Mrs. Ferris has been on a mission trip, and she asked if I would please do the children's sermon today. And I know you're going to help me a whole lot today, right? You're smarter. You're a whole lot smarter than I am. And I am going to ask you, this is, this is my boom box, okay? Uh, I'd like it to play. Let me see if I can get it to turn on. There's no sound. Wonder what's wrong. There's no sound. See, there's a button that says play. And here's pause. Nope, no lights. Hmm. Nothing down here. Wonder what's wrong with it. What? I need to put the antenna. Okay, let's put the antenna up. Okay. Oh. No. Still not working. Let me make sure. Let's see. We've got it on. I got it on. It says the power's on. But no lights are on here. Wonder what else could be wrong. Hmm. What makes something like this go? What would it need? It would need, oh, let's look, let's look. It takes a lot of batteries to run this thing. Oh, no batteries. Oh, but look what I found. Wonder if that would help make it go. You think that would help make it go? What's this? The power cord. Oh, my goodness gracious. I bet this would make it go, don't you? If I plug this in and put it into an electrical outlet, this would let it make music, wouldn't it? Well, one of the things when we come to worship and we stay in worship, we can just show up just like that box, but we don't play anything, we don't hear anything. We have to be plugged in. I have to plug this into that and this into the electricity. 
And Mrs. Ferris reminds me of that on this card that you're going to get to take home. We have to be plugged in to something. We have to be plugged into the electricity to make this work. We have to also be plugged into God and listen really well in worship to the sermon in order to go out and to make music with our lives. When we come to church, we listen to people have a call to worship, right? We had scripture read. We have prayers, and today we're talking about the sermon. And that gets kind of dull sometimes, doesn't it? A little long. Well, let me... (laughs) I know, because I've had to preach some sermons sometimes. But let me tell you this. It gets better when you're plugged in. It gets better when right before the sermon starts, if you say... Dear God, help me listen with my ears and open my heart. That's plugging yourself in. And as you listen to the sermon, as you are plugged in and your ears are open and your heart is open, listen for the stories in the sermon. Because there's usually, when Dr. Kent preaches, he has stories that he will tell. And the stories help us understand the scripture. And sometimes... It's helpful to take your bulletin and write down story one, story two, and story three. And if you're a real good writer, you may want to write one word that goes with that story, like helping or listening or, let's see, being quiet. He has two stories. He's got more than that, but he has particularly two stories that he's going to tell you today that I want you to listen for and see if they help you understand the sermon. It's kind of hard sometimes to explain what it is, but a sermon helps us understand the scripture. And we try to do that through telling stories, through telling uh, what the what the Bible means, but we have to be plugged in to do it. So before the sermon starts and when Dr. Kent prays, your prayer to get yourself plugged in is to say, please, God, open my ears, open my heart so that I can understand the sermon. And when I go out the door, when you go home today, that you can live that sermon. Because when we hear the sermon And when we understand just a little piece of the sermon, then we go out and we live that. So people can see us and they can go, wow, you're a really good person. How did you get to be such a good person? You go, I listened to this sermon in church. I asked God to open my ears and open my heart. And you know, this is what I learned. You think you can do that? Can you stay plugged in so you can make and listen to good things for God to do in your life? Can you do that? Think so? I thank you for being good listeners. So before we leave, let's pray. Gracious God, sometimes it's really hard to stay plugged in to you. But help us open our ears and open our hearts so that we can hear the sermon and hear what you want us to do. Help us to understand how much you love us and how we are to help others in your name. Thank you for caring for us. Thank you for loving us. We make our prayer in your son's name. Amen. And before you leave, I have a card to give to you, and I will put the extras out on the table. Mrs. Ferris has worked very hard um, giving you wonderful information to use in your family and with maybe with your grandma or your grandpa or as you travel or as you go visit somebody and you may want to share these here's one for you here's one for you but please take those home and share them with mom and dad or grandma or grandpa or even a neighbor and i'm so glad you are here today and my prayer for also for me is to open my ears and open my heart so that i might be able to serve i serve god really well this day thank you so much you may go back to your seats
So the children have been reminded that you have to be plugged in. And so we always pray before the sermon. So please join with me. Gracious God, give us the grace to hear your word and to do it. To the glory of Christ, our loving Lord. Amen. You know the phrase. Still nothing. Tell me how we are now. We're good. (laughs) Thank you, Shirley. (laughs) I'm going to owe you. (laughs) Most of you know the phrase that actions speak louder than words. And in Christian circles, you sometimes hear this phrase. I would rather see a sermon than to hear one. Well, we hope you're moved by both. We want to really welcome families again as a part of our summer worship because many of you know we have placed a special emphasis on striving to help dial the children into our shared worship experience because we are really worshiping as a family of faith. And so Jan Ferris has prepared handouts that help the families continue their conversations when they go home, believing that God will help undergird and direct our home life as we seek to honor him there. And as a part of this summer series, we've looked at varying portions of the worship service, the call to worship, the prayer of confession, the sacraments of baptism and communion. And today we're looking at the sermon. Scripture has this great line from Psalm 119. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Now, in the Protestant church, which of course is the church that came to life during the time of the Reformation in the mid-1500s, there was a great emphasis placed on the Word of God, on hearing the Word of God, reading the Word of God, listening for the Word of God, doing the Word of God. And that's one reason why in Presbyterian churches, pulpits tend to be quite large, signifying the importance of the Word of God. I served a church once that had one of these wine glass type pulpits, where a long base that was really meant to be on this level, and it wasn't. It was up on the level of the chancel. And it really left you more than six feet above contradiction, as the phrase goes. And if you got into that pulpit a certain way, it would rock on you. Well, in a whole different kind of way, God's word can rock in you to stir your spirit, to call you to life. 
and to remind you that you are here to make God's kind of difference. And so in Presbyterian churches, there has been a great emphasis upon hearing the word of God and proclaiming the word of God. And so it wouldn't surprise you that a late arriving visitor would have asked an usher saying, is the sermon done? To which a wise usher made this kind of reply. The sermon has already been preached, but it has yet to be done. We are called to do the word of God by the witness of scripture. Jesus said, blessed is the one who hears God's word and puts it into action. That's Luke eleven twenty eight. James, who was the early head of the New Testament church in Jerusalem, framed it a little differently. He said, be doers of the word, not hearers only. We're called in our lives to live out this commitment to our Lord and to remember that God's word is the central source of power. Anytime I have the privilege of giving a sermon or leading in worship, there are a couple of things that you are likely to hear. One is an invitation, really a challenge, to have each day a first-person encounter with God's Word. Friends, it's not enough to live off of the faith or commitment or devotion of another person. We are called up close and personal to experience God's Word on a daily basis. That word has transforming power. That word calls people to faith. It compels us to be more fully the people God would have us be. It puts God's stuff on our radar. It reminds us that our lives are not merely about the narrowness of our own world. It's about God's world defining reality. And so I'm privileged that I've been able to give away 150 one- and two-year Bibles that people are committed to using on a daily basis. And if you would like one, all you need to do is to call me or to shoot me an email, and that will be my gift to you. And your payment will be your commitment to use it. It's one of the reasons why I am so hopeful about the future life of our church. When you have 150 plus people committed to reading God's word on a daily basis, things happen. And I will allow the Holy Spirit to make that translation in your life for what that can mean. God does not leave us static. The other thing you'll frequently hear me say is, remember the importance of leaving room in your heart and life for the maneuvering work of the Holy Spirit. That Holy Spirit works in your midst and mine. That Spirit nudges. It brings into focus. It challenges. It corrects. It inspires. The Holy Spirit calls you to life, to God's kind of life. We will hardly be at our best when we try to control our whole world. 
You are at your finest when you invite God to control your world. Have the confidence in God to allow there to be ample room in your life and heart for the maneuvering power of the Holy Spirit to make you what God would have you be. There are other phrases which for us may typify this importance of living out God's word. Sometimes you hear people say something like, you've got to walk the talk. We know what that means. Sometimes, along with me, you've heard Jan Ferris exclaim something of the content of a conversation she consistently has with her daughter, Sarah and Amy, that you have to be a woman of your word, remembering that our conduct must align with our creed. There must be a consistency there. My favorite phrase is this one. And it puts a mantle of responsibility on each and every one of us because you never know who's watching. And it is this. Remember that you may be the only gospel that someone else ever sees. In great honor to God, we are called to live it out, to do the word of God. Now, I'm doing something this morning that I would never consciously do, but I'm doing it because our children are here, and I want them to get the handle on what this can look like. And it goes back to something I said a number of months ago about a very important person who, in his day, won the most important prize on the planet. And that was called the Nobel Peace Prize, which immediately makes you a worldwide figure. People notice you. You become famous if you win the Nobel Peace Prize. And this man had made it his commitment to do God's word in his life and work. And so he served as a pastor. He served as a writer. He wrote in subjects called philosophy and theology. I'm told that he built organs. He was a recitalist. He would play the organ. He served as a missionary, and he went into a region of Africa where there was no medical care available, and he built a hospital. And he would often travel in Europe and in the United States trying to raise money for that hospital. And sometimes he received it because he would give organ concerts. He was, at this point in time, nearly 80 and still so filled with life. For 80, he was a very large man. He was about six foot four. He had massive hands. And he had this wild, unruly white hair, and he had a big, bushy mustache. And some people would recall the name Albert Schweitzer when I mention it. Schweitzer was now a world-known figure. And on this day, he was going into one of our neighboring cities called the Windy City, Chicago. And that got a lot of curiosity going. And so there was a group of reporters meeting him when he got off the train because they wanted to interview him, wanted to talk to him, wanted to learn what he was doing, wanted to pick his brain a little bit. He was very polite. 
He was also very bright. And he's allowing this interview to take place, but he is momentarily distracted because he notices off to the side coming off the train is a woman who is struggling. This woman is struggling with two large suitcases that she cannot maneuver. And she's trying to get on a city bus to go home. And no one is helping her. Now, I don't know how many of you have struggled with suitcases on occasion. You know, you try to lift them up and you think, good heavens, what did I put in there? You ever had that experience? Of course you have. She cannot get them onto the city bus. No one is coming to her aid. Schweitzer sees this going on and he says to the reporters, excuse me for a minute, please. And he walks the distance, which would be from here to the sidewalk. And he, with his massive hands, picks up these suitcases and loads them onto the city bus. And he helps the woman get on the bus, greets her, wishes her well, and then he makes his way back to the reporters by the train. By now, they are silent They've just witnessed something that to them was awesome. They're also a little bit embarrassed. They could have done something to help that woman. And they'd ignored her need. They'd overlooked her need. They were busy doing their own thing and they weren't mindful. And Schweitzer had filled in the gap and responded. That led one of the reporters to say to the reporters standing next to them, that's the first time I've ever seen a sermon walk. By that act, they had heard the message of what mattered to Albert Schweitzer. What was important to him was clear. They understood the values that guided his life. And you better believe that anything he might say would now be regarded with a whole new sense of respect because this person walked the talk. The world would never have to know what he had done, but you better believe that that lady will never forget it. Where are you being called to walk? What burdens are you being invited to lift? Where are you being prompted by the Holy Spirit to come alongside someone who might feel alone and without an advocate? Someone to help, someone to encourage. Someone to give them strength. I shared that story the other day with a man whom I regard as being a little bit of a Schweitzer scholar. He's just actually published a book on Albert Schweitzer, and he didn't know the story. And he said, you better believe I'm going to use that one of these Sundays. And so sometimes I will stream his church to see when it shows up. But there's another piece to this that others don't know. It was never public, never done by a train or on a city sidewalk. It was done in a classroom. And it affected a dear friend of mine who had that awesome challenge and privilege of being a junior high school teacher. (laughs) If you've ever taught junior high, you know exactly what I mean. Young people at that age are so alive. And in one of his classes, the idea had bubbled up to raise money for Schweitzer's Hospital. And they'd done some fundraising efforts, and they came up with what today would be the equivalent of $100. And they decided they would send it to Lamborghini, which is where the hospital was and still is. 
never knowing if there'd ever be an acknowledgement. About a month later, they got one of those funny looking envelopes that some of you will remember that said on it, par avion, airmail. Remember those? The teacher, Denny, opened it in front of the class. The letter was written by one of Dr. Schweitzer's nurses, who sometimes was called into the correspondence because his correspondence was heavy. And she said, the good doctor has asked me on his behalf to acknowledge your great kindness how he thanks you for remembering the ongoing work and mission of the hospital. Well, they felt pretty great about that. I mean, one of Dr. Schweitzer's nurses wrote. Cool. They didn't have to do that. And then tucked in the envelope is another piece of paper folded over. And my friend pulled it out and realized he couldn't read it because it was in German. And he took it down the hall to the German teacher who offered this translation, something like, Dear students, I cannot tell you what an encouragement your gift is to me and what an inspiration it will provide to the good people of this community. Because of your efforts... God's healing work continues. And may you know throughout your life that you can make God's kind of difference. Signed, simply, A. Schweitzer. He didn't have to write them. The world would never know. Here's a man at that point in time was in correspondence with the president of the United States, John Kennedy, and the premier of the Soviet Union, Nikita Khrushchev, about global disarmament. He had a heavy correspondence, and he didn't want to forget a group of students. And they will never forget it. Whom can you write, encourage, call, let them know that you're having them on your radar? In whose presence might you live out the word of God, which calls us to care in God's kind of way, remembering that it always makes God's kind of difference? It begins here. To hear the word of God. Then do the word of God. And God bless you on your way. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Please be seated. Before we unite our hearts in prayer, I would remind us that we have we have prayer requests listed in our bulletin. People call in and they say, I have a friend who is sick or I have a friend who's facing surgery or this person is going through a difficult time and we have permission to list these names in our bulletin. These people really, really, really need our prayers. We also have a list of those who are serving in the armed services. We have the privilege of praying for these folks who serve and their parents and their families, and it's a gift that we can give to them. And one name that is not listed in our order, in our bulletin this morning, is the Lowe family. Jill Lowe joined the Company of Saints this week. Uh, Her service was Wednesday. And we send our love and our prayers to the entire Lowe family and keep them close to our hearts as they go through this time of learning to live without Jill in the house. She was a bright, shining presence for those of you who have never met her. She's one of those absolutely radiant people. And um, we are richer for having known her, and heaven is richer for having received her. So keep the Lowe family in your prayers. With that, let us unite our hearts in prayer. Honor and glory, majesty and power to you, O Lord. You are our creator, redeemer, and sustainer. You are our savior and our guide. We praise you, we adore you, and we worship you. We bow before you, amazed at your love for for us, and that you continue to help and to seek and to give all that we need to live. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. We ask, Lord, that you open our hearts and our ears to hear your word. And give us the strength to carry through with what we hear, because it's more than just listening. We need to be doers of your word. For us to be really plugged in, we need to go out of this worship service and put the sermon into action and help us do that. You will put someone in our path, Lord, and it's probably going to be something really simple, like lifting a piece of luggage for someone or holding a door open. But we're going to be in a hurry, and we're not going to want to do it. We're not going to want to help the neighbor carry their groceries in or take the newspaper to them or help brush the sidewalk off and clear the things that are on there so someone to keep someone from tripping and falling. It's going to be something really simple that you're going to ask us to do. Help us to stop and to think and to remember that we are living the sermon and we are to do the sermon that you ask us at that moment. Lord God, as we go forth this day, help us to remember those who are living in the midst of disaster because some people still don't have electricity, some people have no water, some people have lost everything they own, they have no food, they have no clothing, and they don't know where their next meal is coming from. Be with them and be with all of those who are helping them to, to have their resources again. Bless those who are grieving. May they know of your comfort and your peace. We pray for those who are in fragile health who live from one medical test to the next, and they hope and they hope and they hope that the next test will bring them good news. Lord, help them, support them, give them your strength and your courage to go on. We pray for those who are traveling and grant them traveling mercies. And for those who are on vacation, may they return refreshed and renewed and restored. We thank you for the choir games that have been in our hometown. We thank you for the joy and the music and everything that has fed us with the the majesty. And bless all of those singers and their leaders and take them back home safe. We pray for our work crew that has just returned from Montana. 
that their lives have been changed and those lives that they've interacted with in Montana have changed. Lord, help the sermon to keep living on in their lives. Bless them, thank them, and uphold them. Lord, you call us to hear, you call us to do. Bless us. And we realize we may be the only gospel, the only sermon someone will see. Keep us faithful, and may we have our hearts open and our ears open to listen, to serve, and to do in your name. We make our prayer in the name of Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We have the privilege of continuing our worship by making an offering of our life, our time, our resources, and our talents to the Lord. Let us give gratefully, joyfully, and generously to this God who loves us and calls us to be his own. Let us worship God with our tithes and offerings.
Let us pray. Gracious God, you are an awesome God who does rule with power from above in majesty and grace. We bring these gifts to you, awesome God. We are grateful to be your people. You have been generous with us, and now we are generous in giving these offerings to you. Take what we bring so that it will become a living sermon for those in need of good news. Thank you for blessing us that we may bless others. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. And now, dear friends, as only you can, go with joy, live in faith, believe that life is good, and if you find it not, help make it so, to the glory of God who made us, and may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship, friendship, and power of the Holy Spirit lead us forward together each step of the way. Amen. Thank you.